True Gay Crime contains coarse language, adult themes, and content that is violent and disturbing. If at any time you feel you need help, please refer to the toll-free crisis lines in the show notes. Welcome to another episode of True Gay Crime. I'm your host, Patrick Morano, and on today's episode, we cover the story of Arthur Gary Bishop, a.k.a. Roger Downs, a.k.a. Lynn Jones. Okay, I'm seeing a pattern here. Like, not only do a lot of serial killers have three names, Arthur Gary Bishop, but they always have AKAs. They always have these fake aliases that they need to create because they're on the run. Oh, so which comes first? The serial killer or the three names or the AKAs? Anyway, this guy is a nightmare. He's a sex offender, serial killer. He would go on to be Utah's most notorious killer of the 20th century. So this guy sucks balls big time. So I'm going to give an extra trigger warning for this episode because talking about pedophilia and child sex abuse is very difficult for most people. So there's some of that in here. I don't go into details, just so you know. I do gloss over it a little bit in terms of um, details because, quite frankly, we don't need to hear about details. We get the picture. Um, but he was a pedophile. Um, and we do talk about gay conversion therapy in this episode. Uh, and, of course, murder. So little extra trigger warning there for us. Let's talk about the sources for this story. I used Wikipedia and Murderpedia, of course. I found an article on criminallyintrigued.com, and I got great information. So I've been listening to this podcast. I'm going to shout out this podcast called Bad Gays, and it's fantastic. So every episode, they focus on a gay in history, and they go all the way back. I mean, I just listened to one on uh, Alexander the Great. So, I mean, it goes back to whenever they need to go back to. Um, And then they cover stories of gays, and then... They go through all the details, and then at the end of the story, they kind of assess, like, I mean, the podcast is called Bad Gays, and they kind of assess, like, okay, well, is this guy or gal a bad gay? Were they actually a bad gay, or did they just do bad things? Were they a product of their environment, et cetera, et cetera? So I've been listening to Bad Gays, and you should too, and there was one episode on Arthur Gary Bishop. I think it might be the latest episode, actually. Hmm. So I listened to that and I got notes from them. So shout out to the guys over at Bad Gaze. Thank you so much. So without further ado, let us now get into the story of Arthur Gary Bishop. It's the late 1970s and Arthur Gary Bishop is nervous. He'd been working at the used car dealership for a while now. He was a smart guy, good at his job, but the money coming in just wasn't enough. No matter how hard he tried, he just couldn't make ends meet. Something had to change. So, slowly at first, he starts stealing money from work, skimming off the top, cooking the books so that no one would be the wiser. Maybe if I just take small amounts, no one will notice, he thought. But as time passed, the amounts grew, and his greed and his need for more and more money grew with it. The cracks were beginning to show. It was only a matter of time now before he would be caught, but he couldn't let that happen. He needed the money. Kids wouldn't just pose for nude photos for free. They expected to be paid. And he wasn't about to stop his most favorite hobby in the world. Who is this guy who struggled constantly with his Mormon faith but couldn't help his urges? Let's find out. To help put things into context, but by no means letting this monster off the hook, let's have a quick history lesson about Mormonism in the United States. It's the 1800s, and the Mormons have been expelled from almost everywhere they once were. They settle in Utah, where the men start to get frisky with each other, so the head of the church decides that in order to stop men from getting, quote, bored with their wives, they can have multiple wives. (laughs) Yeah, because if I'm gay, that's what'll cure me. More women. But men remain close, and there's even male-only dances, which apparently aren't sexual, but I would love to see what that looks like. Like, what is a male-only dance? Are they slow dancing? Are they line dancing? (laughs) What are they doing? Are they just freestyling in the corner? Like, I don't... 
what do you mean? Like, it's a male-only dance. How is it not gay? Anyway. There were even men who were dressed as women, and they performed in bars. Yeah, they're called drag queens. So, my friends, drag queens existed in Mormon, Utah, in the 1800s. But, of course, it's not considered a sex thing. It's just dress up, it's costumes, it's entertainment only. But things are about to take a turn for the worse, because in 1904, they end polygamy, and they start a super conservative way of life. Especially after the world wars, it's all about the heterosexual nuclear family. And now that it's all like traditional family stuff, anything that sticks out as different is shunned and the Mormons push back against gays who they call perverts. Which brings us to the Brigham Young University or BYU, which is a private research university in Provo, Utah, sponsored by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. At BYU in 1959, they launch a surveillance program of the students to weed out any homos or people they thought could be, quote, contaminated. They'd patrol gay bars and see students were coming and going, and they were checking the parked cars for BYU bumper stickers. I mean, if you're that interested in the gay bar, just go inside, like have a drink, enjoy the atmosphere a little bit, and then, you know, just go in and see if you see anyone. Don't sit outside like a weirdo. They even pay for gay dating ads to entrap students who'd answer them. Oh, also, masturbation is a sin, and it'll make you gay. So I guess everyone in that case is gay. BYU professors who catch students being gay experiment with electroshock therapy, which is treatment where a generalized seizure is electrically induced to manage refractory mental disorders. And I googled it. It's still in use today. I mean, not as gay conversion therapy. They don't do that anymore. Uh, but they use it for extreme cases of depression. They still do it. I don't know. Does it work? I guess. Then, possibly, one of the worst books ever published comes out in 1969. Ironically, that's the summer of love, but this book is pure hate. It's called The Miracle of Forgiveness. Don't give it a cute, like, holy title and mask all your hate with this, you know, miracles and forgiveness. There's nothing about forgiveness in this book. It's required reading at the time for all Mormon churchgoers. In the book, they talk about homosexual relationships as detestable, repugnant, ugly. It's the sin of the ages, and it's just below murder in the hierarchy of sins. Okay, whoever wrote this book is obviously gay, and he hates himself. The book says that homosexuality destroyed Rome and it was on his way to destroy America as well. And they thought it could be punishable or should be punishable by death. Then in the 1970s, the Mormon church tells people that gays will corrupt your children, leading them to porn and abuse and drugs. Oh, and gays a choice, by the way, they're saying. So choose wisely. It's in this environment that Arthur Gary Bishop is born in a tiny rural town in Hinckley, Utah, with less than 700 residents, and is 100 miles southwest of Salt Lake City. Tourists don't come here, and the locals have a hard life making their living from the sun-baked earth. The men are hard, and scorpions and rattlesnakes are common. The men are hard? That's what I wrote. <laughs> the men are hard. I think I meant the men were like hard ass, like they're, they're like tough guys. <laughs> All the men are walking around with hard-ons. Uh, okay. So anyway, Bishop is the eldest of six brothers. There's nine kids in total, in total, by the way, like close your legs. What are you doing? I guess that's how it was done. There is some evidence that he was sexually abused as a kid, but there's no real, uh, proof of that. One of his younger brothers, Douglas is born in 1956 and three decades later, it would be revealed how much the two brothers had in common. So bookmark that for later. Book mark that you will not believe. Okay, we'll revisit that. Uh, Bishop is sensitive. He's a loner. He's a nerd. He's overweight. He wears glasses. He has a speech impediment. And it's at 14 that he realizes, oh, wait, I'm gay. So he develops a crush on a seven-year-old boy at the pool. So this is interesting, and it kind of begs the question. We're going to talk a lot about this topic of pedophilia, but... He's 14 years old, so he's a kid, but he is looking at a kid who's half his age already. At 14, he's looking at somebody half his age, a seven-year-old boy at the pool. So, 
pedophilia, you're born that way. Because at 14, you, I mean, anyway, it's a discussion we're going to continue later. Uh, but just remember this incident. Uh, as a young teen, he has sex with boys his age, like mutual masturbation kind of stuff. He's an Eagle Scout and he's an honor student. Okay. It's a Mormon tradition now that when you turn 19, you go to the Philippines for a couple of years to do missionary work. So in 1969, after graduating high school, Bishop heads to the Philippines where it's common to see young boys running around naked in the scorching heat. He doesn't have anyone to confide in about his homosexuality. The only reference he has is his Mormon Bible, which says he's basically evil. He's going to hell. Anyway, he was hoping that being... In the Philippines on a mission would help cure him of his desires, but he just ends up masturbating to the thought of the young boys running around. He swirls down a shame spiral and he repents for his actions, but then he does it all over again and the cycle would continue. Finally, he has enough and downs a bottle of aspirin in an attempt to kill himself, but he throws it up and he survives. And when his mission is over, he comes home to Utah. Now, they never said if anything happened in the Philippines. I'm going to go out on a limb and say, abso fucking lootly it did. I mean, nowhere could I find any information about that, but I think it's pretty safe to assume that when he was over there, shit was going down with the kids, which is really sad. So he's back in Utah. He enrolls at Stevens Henniger College, which is a fast-track business school, and he completes an accounting course with top grades. So he's not stupid. In his early 20s and after his graduation, he gets a job at a car dealership, and that's where he starts embezzling the money, as we heard in the opening story. This is 1978 now. The money he's stealing was to pay kids to pose for nude photos. Doesn't this remind you of Daniel Conahan that we just covered a couple episodes ago? Daniel Conahan in southwest Florida was paying transient guys to pose for naked bondage um, photos. Around then, he starts a relationship with a boy named Eric who's receptive to the relationship. So this is a... They're, they're both into it. B Bishop lavishes gifts on the boy. Now, we're not sure how old Eric is, but we can assume, I think, that he's much younger. Eventually, Eric gets bored with Bishop and he wants to date other boys, so they break up. Bishop keeps stealing from work to pay for boys for photos and for videos. Now, he's caught, of course, but seems repentant. He pleads guilty, and he gets a five-year suspended sentence on the promise of restitution and going to therapy. So a suspended sentence, I, I wasn't sure what that meant, so I googled it. It's a sentence on conviction, on conviction of a criminal offense, the serving of which the court orders to be deferred, in order to allow the defendant to perform a period of probation. So basically, they're saying, okay, you this is your sentence, but we're going to put that on pause and give you a chance to sort of make things right. Which in this case would be going to therapy, paying back the money you stole, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So he's basically on parole, given the opportunity to pay back the money, but... Instead, he decides to skip town and he heads to Salt Lake City, where he changes his name to avoid arrest. Alarmingly, this actually works, even though he only flees like 100 miles away and looks basically exactly the same. Like, <laughs> he's not that far. And the cops are like, where'd he go? Anyway, he changes his name to Roger Downs, at which point he asks the church to excommunicate him. So... He starts to drift from the church because he feels that he can't live up to their standards. So basically, this whole time, he's struggling with his gay feelings. And not just his gay feelings, but the fact that he's attracted to extremely young boys. And he can't reconcile the fact of that with his religion. Usually, it's the church that excommunicates people. So basically, the church is giving you a time out for other people so they can get their shit together. That's what the, usually happens. But in this case, Bishop is the one asking for this separation from church because he can't handle the guilt. Now, when you're excommunicated, what that means is you aren't held to the high moral standards that the church has set, meaning God wouldn't be judging you so harshly for being a homosexual and a pedophile if Bishop didn't belong to the church. See, my problem is, is that I hold myself accountable for things that I do. So I only have myself to blame and I really only care like how I feel about myself and my actions. So 
you know, not what some third party feels like some priest or some church or some God, you know, it's really, how do, how do I feel about myself when I do these things? But of course he's third partying it and saying, well, they're saying it's bad. So I'm going to separate myself from this institution. So I don't feel so bad when I do these things. So basically he feels this is his get out of jail free card is what it is. And the church complies in October, 1978. So most people, by the way, come back to the church once they figured out their issues and stuff, not this guy. So now he's free from the judgment of the church and he stops going completely. He joins a big brother program under his new pseudonym. And now he has an endless supply of boys to molest and abuse under the guise of being a big brother, which is horrifying. Horrifying. Now, remember, this is like the late 70s, the dawn of the 80s. We're not yet into the stranger danger uh, messaging of the Reagan administration, but we're going to get there. You'll see. So he's targeting uh, young boys in the Big Brother program, young cousins that he has, and neighborhood kids. A spokesperson for the Big Brother organization would later admit that they received tips that Bishop, who was now last name Downs, had molested two boys, although they weren't the boys that were assigned to him. So the accusations were even reported to the police, but the police didn't do anything. So I'm not sure what happened there. There were reports of it. I think even the whiff, I mean, in a program like Big Brother, uh, even the whiff of something not right should be taken extremely seriously. And the fact that there was tips about molestation and not just, what, like multiple boys? I don't understand that the police wouldn't do anything, that the Big Brother organized, like, how do you turn a blind eye? eye to that even i mean you have to look into it you have to you have there's no choice i mean you have to it anything that comes your way you have to look into it and see if it's true don't know what happens there uh wherever he went apparently his charisma uniqueness nerve and talent oh my god sorry that's too much drag race um apparently he was very charismatic um and that would lower the defense of his victims and it allowed the him It allowed him to lure kids to his home or on camping trips. I mean, what kind of parent lets their kid go on a camping trip with some strange man? So he starts another relationship, if you want to call it that, with another boy named Jess. In public, he acts like Jess's adopted father, but in private, he's abusing Jess's friends. So I'm not sure in the relationship, quote unquote, I think that, I mean, obviously this this was a kid, like a boy, um, and they probably just had a quote unquote relationship. I don't think he was abusing Jess in that way. Although Jess was probably too young to be making his own decisions in that regard, but apparently he was abusing Jess's friends. So Bishop has access to a lot of kids. It's only a matter of time before things go from horrible to even worse. On October 14th, 1979, Bishop is living in an apartment complex across the hall from a four-year-old boy named Alonzo Daniels. He lures the boy into his place with the promise of candy, and while attempting to assault him, the boy starts screaming in protest, threatening to tell his mom, and Bishop panics. He grabs a hammer nearby and hits the boy on the head, but the crying continues, so he takes the boy to the bathroom and drowns him in the bathtub. Four years old. The murder is not planned, and he justifies his actions by convincing himself that he didn't want to be harmed in jail. He knew, of course, and it's true, that child molesters in jail are often abused by the other inmates. So he had to hide his crime, a crime he soon realized actually aroused him as well. Alonzo's mother, of course, is panicked when she can't find her boy. She gets relatives and neighbors to scour the neighborhood. They go door to door, but they don't find anything. Police come and question everyone, including Bishop, who obviously denies knowing anything at all. So without any leads and no body, they come up empty handed. Of course, officers could in no way know that Alonzo was already dead by the time they knocked on Bishop's door. He had been put in a cardboard box, carried through the apartment building past the panicked mother who's calling out Alonzo's name 
and the box was put into Bishop's car. By late afternoon, Salt Lake County's search and rescue team had joined the fruitless hunt for Alonzo Daniels. Hundreds of civilians pitched in over the next few days. I mean, when it's a kid of that, that age, everybody wants to help. Everybody. Uh, even students from the faculty in the University of Utah and members of the Teamsters Union local. Photos of Alonzo and descriptions of his clothing, he was wearing a cream-colored t-shirt, are printed and broadcast throughout the state, and police are questioning hundreds and hundreds of people. But while all this is going on, Bishop is driving the cardboard box to Cedar Fort, which is 20 miles southwest of Salt Lake City, and he buries Alonzo in the desert. Driving the box to the desert, Bishop feels scared. He's revolted by what he's done, but he's also excited. Through it all, he kind of liked it, and he knew at that moment that he would strike again. Now that he had killed once, he has a taste for it, but he looks for a less dangerous outlet for his urges. This is when he goes out and he adopts about 20 puppies from Salt Lake City Animal Shelters, and over the next year, he kills them one by one. This is also another thread that obviously we've seen in serial killers where they just abuse and murder animals. He says, quote, it was so stimulating. A puppy whines just like Alonzo did. I would get frustrated at the whining. I would hit them with hammers or drown them or strangle them. I mean, animal rights activists. Ooh, shaka Khan. Okay. Neighbors didn't seem to notice the cruelty to animals, and if they did, well, it doesn't compare to murdering a child. There's something weird in this story where a lot of people seem to turn a blind eye. So I don't know if people knew that there was animal cruelty going on, or I'm sure they knew something weird was going on. But maybe you just assume that, well, the guy next door is not killing puppies. I mean, that's that's weird, right? Um, but it seems like a lot of people were turning a blind eye during this time. Um, I think it, it might have been a more innocent time where you assumed the best in people, and I don't think that's the case anymore. So, puppies only go so far, obviously, with this monster, and he continues to molest kids on and off, threatening them so they don't tell adults. So he's still continuing his assaulting. He's not murdering them. So basically, he's telling them not to say anything, which is seems very risky. I don't, you know... I'm surprised not one of them told. Well, actually, they did. We'll get there. Okay. The only time he would kill kids was if he felt uh, too much of a resistance from them, and therefore he saw a future of being abused by inmates in prison, which, frankly, would be very well deserved. Now, it's Saturday, November 8th, 1980, and 11-year-old Kim Peterson is at the roller rink, but so is Bishop. A roller rink is always filled with kids, and some get separated from the rest. On this particular day, Bishop approaches Kim, and they get to talking. Kim, it turns out, I mean, where's the adult supervision? This would never happen today. There would never be kids at a roller rink with no adults. I mean, and then you can just go up and talk to a kid, and nobody's going to be like, whoa, dude, who are you? Like, some things just wouldn't happen today. Kim, it turns out, uh, has a pair of roller skates for sale, which Bishop pretends to be interested in buying for $35, which in that day sounds expensive. Um, they set up a rendezvous for the next day, and on the 9th of November, Kim leaves his home with the skates, never to come home. Police show up at the Peterson home around sundown since Kim never came home for dinner. Police canvass the neighborhood and the roller rink. Witnesses remember Kim talking to some man in his late 20s, with a full face, with glasses, blue jeans, and an army-style jacket. In a strange twist, two witnesses even agree to be hypnotized, and the police learn their suspect may weigh around 200 pounds with dark hair and bushy eyebrows. But the leads are useless and go nowhere. No connection is ever made between the witness descriptions of the man at the roller rink and Bishop. Bishop was a nothing guy with a nothing personality, and he never stood out to police for any reason. How could they know this nothing man had buried Kim Peterson next to Alonzo's body outside of Cedar Fort in the desert? For Bishop, the second murder was easier than the first, and the desert was a big place with a lot of room to bury bodies. He was terrified of arrest, or more specifically jail, so he would always spare his victims if they promised not to say anything. I mean, talk about trauma. But the thrill of murder nagged at him, and 11 months later, he's at it again. While at the supermarket on October 20th, 1981, Bishop sees what he would later say was, quote, 
I saw the most beautiful little boy kneeling in the aisle. But this beautiful boy, who is named Danny Davis, isn't 20 years old. He isn't 14 or even 10. He's only four years old, and he's playing with a gumball machine, trying to get, trying to get one out without paying for it. Bishop walks up to Danny and offers him candy, but the boy refuses. Bishop gives up and he starts to walk for the exit, but to his surprise, the boy Danny is following him to the exit. He waits for him just outside the door, and he leads him to the parking lot. Danny's grandmother, who's now finished with her grocery shopping, starts looking for the boy. She gets word when she can't find him and calls the store manager. Now, at first, I was like, I can't believe she let her eyes off the kid. But I think it's too easy to blame her. Like, I know how quickly these things can happen, and it was probably a matter of minutes when she wasn't looking at him. You know, it sounds like, oh, she was shopping, and an hour went by, but it was probably, like, literally five minutes. Um, And also, she's in a store. Like, she's assuming everything is okay. There's other people around. I mean, God. And it's a simpler time. They're not in, like, a huge city. They're in Salt Lake City, so it's not... You don't assume there's going to be a predator in the aisle with you. Well, you do now. So witnesses remember that there was a boy by the gumball machine being spoken to by a smiling young man. Again, they do hypnosis, but any IDs are elusive. And once again, searches scour the neighborhood and nearby desert and mountains. Temperatures dropped drastically that night, and there was a huge fear that Danny could be exposed to the cold weather which is frightening to everyone. The next day, divers are sent down to the bottom of Big Cottonwood Creek near the town, and they search ponds, ditches, alleys, and garbage piles, but nothing comes up. No one could know that Bishop had already buried Danny next to his other two victims out in the desert. The search for Danny quickly becomes the most intensive search in the history of Salt Lake City. I'm assuming is because of his age. Like I said, I mean, the younger the kid, the more people... Uh, panic, and then also the fact that he's the third one to go missing now. So they really up the stakes. They really up the ante here. They print flyers with his photos, and copies are sent throughout the United States to enforcement agencies. There's even a $20,000 reward for any information, but nothing comes up. The FBI are involved, Child Find, the National Crime Information Center are all doing their part, but still nothing. Bishop lives only half a block from the supermarket, but tells police, of course, he knows nothing about what happened when they come knocking at his door. Police don't put it together that Alonzo, Kim, and now Danny all live within close proximity to Bishop, a man that they've talked to now three times. During this time, Arthur Gary Bishop is going not only by the alias of Roger Downs, but also he's created another one, Lynn E. Jones. And he's using this at his place of employment, which is a local ski shop where he's working as a bookkeeper and where, not surprisingly, he's embezzling money to finance his photo shoots and video shoots with boys. And then one day he doesn't come back to work after lunch. The They find that he's taken $10,000 and all of his personal files with him. A virtual statewide panic is happening at the same time when a little girl named Rachel Runyon is kidnapped from her school playground south of Salt Lake City in August 1982. When the girl is found dead, politicians scramble to make their constituents feel safe. They pass a law where, so capital punishment is already a thing in Utah, but politicians make child abduction one of the very worst things that you can do, and they implement the strictest punishments in the country. While people applaud the effort, it does zero to stop further child abductions. So we have to remember that this is the 1980s now, and the message of stranger danger is at its highest peak. And Bishop is only one of a slew of serial killers stalking the streets. A few years earlier, Ted Bundy was killing women in the very same state of Utah, and Jeffrey Dahmer was making headlines at this exact same time. During this time, also in the 1980s, there are over 200 known serial killers working in the U.S. alone. And if you compare that number with only 61, well, only, (laughs) okay, I guess relative, but anyway, only 61 serial killers were active in the 2000s. So like I said, the 80s was a peak of stranger danger, it's scary clowns, it's hitchhiker danger, it's poison Halloween candy. I remember all this. I remember all this. 
The new right, which was Ronald Reagan, is very conservative. They fight against abortion, drugs, birth control. They're anti-porn, anti-homosexuality, anti-sex education, claiming that these are all scourges that were destroying families and ending America. Porn, they decide, leads to incest, rape, child abuse, and they villainize the industry. Of course, no one was talking about the fact that most child abuse cases come from within the heterosexual nuclear family and goes undetected because the family unit is sacred. The fears all congealed to form conspiracy theories at the time, including, get this, a secret underground child sex abuse ring. What? Are you kidding me right now? This is exactly what QAnon is pushing today, like right now, as I speak. I, when I hear the news, I'm like, okay, where is this crazy shit coming from? We've already covered this. We've already talked about underground child sex abuse rings. They were pushing it in the 80s and they're doing it again because they want to scare Americans to think that these things are real and that American life, as they know it, is being destroyed, they're going to get scared and they're going to vote for the people that are vowing to stop these things. I feel it must be, they must pull this card out of their back pocket, they meaning like these crazy, super right-wing QAnon weirdos like Marjorie Taylor Greene or whatever the fuck her name is. They must pull this out of their back pocket when they're like backed into a corner and they're like, wow, we're fucked right now. Like Trump made us look like total assholes. We've lost everything. Uh, so we need to pull out all the stops. So let's start talking about secret underground child sex abuse rings. I mean, this was a national obsession in the 80s and people thought that school teachers were conducting satanic sex rituals on children. Like, like these are exactly the same things that they're using saying about Biden and the Democrats today. So this isn't even new rhetoric. This isn't even like uh, new stories. I can't believe this is recycled bullshit. Like, <laughs> cause I was too young. So I didn't in the eighties, I didn't hear about all of these underground child sex abuse ring accusations and things. But of course I'm old enough now and I'm hearing about it. I can't believe they're reusing the same narratives it's crazy and we have to listen to like marjorie taylor green or fucking ted cruz and all these assholes and it's so sad this is a bit of a rant sorry it's so sad that that we know their names more than the people on the opposite side that we might tend to agree with more like aoc thank god okay i know one Whew. Okay, so back to this little girl was abducted and she was murdered this is all part of the panic now it's like hitting a boiling point Police find no connection between Rachel's abduction and her murder and the abductions of the three young boys in Salt Lake City. As we've seen in a lot of these stories, there's a task force that is created with the Metropolitan Hall of Justice in Salt Lake City, representatives of the city police department and detectives from the Salt Lake and Davis County Sheriff's Office. They join agents of the FBI. Now, together, they review the open cases. They can't find a pattern. Victims go missing at different times and different days of the week. Alonzo is African-American while the others were blonde. And Kim was a bit older than the other two, so they can't really nail down a pattern. And with no leads, the case goes cold by June 23rd, 1983. That's nearly two years since the last disappearance. But Bishop is about to strike again. It was Troy Ward's sixth birthday, and he's playing alone in the park near his home. The plan was for him to meet a family friend on the street corner at 4 p.m., and then he'd be taken home for cake and presents. Wow, times have changed. Like, can you imagine a kid playing alone in a park these days? Mm-mm. -mm. At 4 p.m., there's no Troy. Police are called, and they search the streets around the park. One witness sees a boy fitting Troy's description leaving the park with a man on foot. The witness thought that they were father and son since they seemed to get on. Bishop takes the boy home. He assaults him and was considering letting him go, but the boy eventually starts threatening to report the incident, and Bishop decides he has to kill him. He uses the hammer and bathtub to do it. Instead of his usual burial ground, Bishop takes Troy to Big Cottonwood Creek and he buries him there. And then, now I guess he felt like he was back in it, he had a thirst for it, because not even a month later, Bishop strikes again. On July 14th, 1983, 13-year-old Graham Cunningham is excited. His camping equipment is packed 
and his upcoming camping trip is the only thing that he can talk about. It's only days until he and his friend are going to go on a camping trip with a chaperone. But Graham doesn't know that his friend named Jess is dating someone much older. And he doesn't know that the person his friend is dating will also be their chaperone. And he doesn't know that the person his friend is dating and who will be their chaperone is Arthur Gary Bishop. But just days before he's supposed to go on this camping trip, Graham disappears without a trace. When he doesn't come home for dinner, his parents call the police. The disappearance, one of many at this point, makes statewide news. Bishop, obviously known to the parents since he was going to be the chaperone on their son's camping trip with his buddy. So, which kind of raises the question, like, did Jess know what Bishop was like? I'm going to say no, because... I don't think that Jess would be in a relationship with a man that was known to assault and molest and murder boys, I think. But obviously Bishop is way too old for Jess. I mean, he's 32 years old at this point, and these are boys. Um, Bishop didn't want to wait, obviously, until they were in the forest. Like, he was going to be alone in the forest with Jess and Graham. But he decided to take Graham before the camping trip. So I'm not sure what clicked in his mind. And he thought, no, I better do this before. Or this is a good idea. I I don't know what his thinking is there. Um, But since he knows the parents, this is really fucked up. He goes to offer any help and support that they need during this time. And he would later tell investigators that his impulse was sincere. Quote, I wanted to help her. I just didn't know how to tell her that I killed her son. Oh, so all the while, police are questioning basically everybody, even Bishop. They start to see some red flags in his behavior. They learn about his fondness for neighborhood kids and that he's wanted now for embezzlement under the alias of Lynn Jones for the $10,000 that he stole from the ski shop. And they begin to piece together that he was personally questioned after each disappearance and that he knew the parents of the fifth victim. So... Cases with serial killers are often cracked that way where killers let down their guard and they make mistakes. But with only suspicions about the abductions, but a clear reason to arrest him on the embezzlement, they bring him down on the ladder. While in custody, the pieces really start to fall into place and they learn that he was in the vicinity of all five victims and he quickly becomes the main suspect. It doesn't take long before Bishop caves completely and he starts to spill his guts to cops. He reveals his different identities, he admits to the murders, and he would even go on to show them exactly where the bodies are buried. Bishop and the investigators spend most of the night talking, and the next day, he takes them out to find the bodies. Bishop would later say, quote, I'm glad they caught me, because I'd do it again. Unfortunately, P- police discover that there are way more than five victims in this case. Scores of boys were sexually molested in the Salt Lake area. They weren't murdered, but they were molested. Authorities also revealed that in the four-year run of Bishop, there were parents who were aware of his activities, but for one reason or another, they didn't report it. After his arrest, the station is swamped with calls from parents who report that their child or a neighbor's child had been molested. None of them had come forward while the investigation was ongoing, and authorities can't understand why no one came forward. Detective Captain John Pillai says, quote, Where were these people two or three years ago when we had nothing? That's a great question, Captain John Pillai. So let's talk about that for a second. Why would a parent have that kind of information and not go to the police with it? These are a few reasons that I've come up with. So one, they aren't sure. And I think if it's just something that you might be suspecting, but you don't have any proof about, it's not something you want to bring to life in your life. And for your child's life, for a few more reasons like this, shame, shame on the family, shame on you for being a bad parent, the guilt that you would feel that you allowed a circumstance to happen where your child was put in harm's way. So you don't want to admit to yourself, let alone the police, that something like that could have happened. Also stigma. The stigma that would be attached to your child and to your family from the outside world and that you would feel also 
um, people would judge you. People would judge you as a parent. People would judge your family. There would be sort of this shame, stigma, and guilt that would sort of cloud your entire existence and sort of cover your household. And these are all reasons, I believe, because I can't think of many others, other than you don't want also the media attention, because this would be very media frenzy for, you know, a parent to go to the police, and then your family would, I mean, the names would come out, you know, and then your children still have to go to school, and they're, they're trying to live their lives. And then here you are thrusting your family and your child onto the world stage in a story that's so revolting, um, where people can shame and judge you and stigmatize you. And so, I mean, for those reasons, I feel like if you're a parent and you think that that happened, or maybe even if you knew that it did happen, you might not go to the police. You might try to deal with it on your own, maybe through therapy, or maybe just by sticking your head in the sand. I mean, in any case, it's hard to understand when you're not in the situation, but I suppose, I mean, there were, the word was scores. I mean, that's a lot of boys, scores and scores of boys. So not all the parents knew, not all the kids talked, but you have to assume that there was a number of them that did and none of them went to the police. So again, then you have to assume that that's not an easy place to be in. It's not an easy position to be in. And apparently it's easier to not go to the police than it is to report somebody like this. So after recovering all the boys' bodies from the desert, the police invade Bishop's house of horrors to find unspeakable photographs and videos of young boys. Police retrieve a 38 caliber ro revolver, a bloodstained mallet and hammer, dozens of photos depicting nude boys. Many of the photos are framed to exclude faces, making the identification impossible, but obviously it's proof of his propensity towards child molestation. They even find a book called 100 Ways to Disappear and Live Free, which he used as a blueprint to reinvent himself and disappear from police. Before Bishop even gets to trial, but while he's in prison, he learns that his younger brother, Douglas, is also in jail. So remember at the top of this story, I said him and his brother had something in common. Well, guess what it is? His brother, his younger brother, was in jail for sexually abusing young boys around Provo in Utah County, South Lake City. Like what? Two in one family? I mean, I know there's nine kids, but still, statistically speaking, come on. Two pedophiles in one family? Like what? <sighs> This kind of goes to my theory about being genetically fucked up and predisposed to pedophilia. Um, maybe it's a genetic thing uh, that was being passed on in the family. Something that needs to be looked after, addressed, confronted, uh, and dealt with. And obviously wasn't. Because remember, Bishop was 14, as I mentioned, when he was lusting after a 7-year-old. So, I mean, as a 14-year-old, you don't really know what you're doing. You don't know any better. So he was just, that's his instinct. His instinct is to lust after someone that age. Because he wasn't 7 lusting for a 7-year-old. He's 14. That's a different age. That's twice as old. Yes, I can do math. Okay. We're not going to figure it out in this podcast, but food for thought. So there's no evidence to suggest that they shared victims, which would have been extra creepy, but obviously it raises questions about how this could happen. Now, on to the trial. Bishop goes to trial February 27th, 1984. In court, Bishop says that it's porn. So now he starts to lay the groundwork for why he's this way blaming everything but himself. So he says it's porn that led to his downfall and that he's addicted to child pornography, which obviously is just deflecting the blame. He doesn't feel, so he doesn't feel so bad, but somebody should tell him uh, that as people, we have choices and we have the ability to make choices and to choose. So you can choose not to watch those movies, right? Like, 
nobody's forcing you to watch child pornography. Hmm? Jurors hear Bishop's taped confession, which includes a lot of disgusting details. Once again, being a jury member is not easy, folks. At points in the taped confession, he's actually giggling which I don't know if he was uncomfortable when he's confessing. And other times he mimics a boy's final words and he's using a falsetto voice. That's fucking creepy. That would scar me to hear this taped confession of this guy. Deputy County Attorney Robert Stott says this of Bishop in an interview describing him as a ruthless killer and a sexual deviant possessed of, quote, a scheming, calculating, cunning mind. While Bishop describes his crimes as seemingly simple, saying, quote, you can offer children anything and they'll go with you. Bishop's defense uh, has no real hope of acquittal. His taped confession literally seals his fate uh, for a life behind bars, but they still try to lessen the final sentence to manslaughter from first-degree murder. Imagine that's your job. Like, what a horrible job. Like, you know this guy's... You you fucking know this guy's guilty. He even said he was guilty, and you're trying to get him a lesser sentence? Like, that's your job? I couldn't do it. They argue that Bishop has psychological deficits that drive him to kill, and they tell the court that Bishop, quote, became, for some reason, stuck or fixated with a sexual attraction to little boys. He never outgrew those erotic feelings. He was a lonely, frightened child. Mm. You know who was a lonely, frightened child? His fucking victims. And the blame, again, of course, is porn, which, like, just don't watch it. Like, and by the way, he's wa- what he's watching is illegal. Like, that's illegal porn. You have to go in the dark web to find this kind of shit. This isn't mainstream porn. So everyone get off of porn, right? This is dark web shit that you have to go digging around and finding. So... An expert witness on the subject, Dr. Victor Klein, was called by the defense to testify that porn had warped Bishop's mind to the extent that he could not resist his attraction to children or the killing urges that followed. Of course, that's completely dismissed, and it doesn't matter because the trial only lasts three weeks, and on March 19, 1984, five men and seven women on the jury find him guilty of five counts of aggravated murder, five counts of aggravated kidnapping, which, if you don't know... Because on true gay crime, what? We love to learn. So the difference between murder and aggravated murder is that aggravated murder consists of purposefully causing the death of another with prior calculation and design or purposefully causing the death of another under the age of 13. And aggravated kidnapping is when somebody kidnaps for ransom or if the victim suffers or is likely to die. He also gets one count of sexually abusing a minor. And I had a thought, like, shouldn't the penalty increase as the child's age decreases? Like, if you're 16, like, you know how 16 is considered underage? Okay, so then you would get, you know, whatever the penalty is for 16. But each age that it goes down, shouldn't the penalty increase? So 15, the child's 14, 13, 12, 11, 10. And as the age goes down, the penalty goes up. Well, I guess the death penalty is the death penalty. <laughs> what else? Can, where can you go from there? Um, he is when he is sentenced. He apologizes to the victim's family. Which when when does that ever help? I'm, I'm thinking if I was a parent and then this guy who molested and murdered my child was up there apologizing, that would actually infuriate me more because I would just see through that as you're just trying to appease yourself and make yourself feel better. You're not making me feel better at all. In fact, I want to kill you right now. Pushing a lot of buttons for me. Okay. (laughs) So this asshole gets the death penalty with Judge J. Banks making it official, condemning Bishop from the bench. State law gives Bishop the choice between execution by firing squad or lethal injection. Without a second thought, he chooses the needle. We're going to get into that in just a second. Of course, while Bishop is in prison, he gets all religious because that's what you do when you run out of options. You start grasping at straws. And he goes on to say, quote, it's with great sadness and remorse. I realized that I allowed myself to be misled by Satan. Okay, so now it's not porn. Now it's Satan. Okay, you're just a coward and you can't take responsibility for yourself. Perfect. He's repenting, which means a change of heart and a will to live. So his attorneys put in a petition for a new trial, which is quickly rejected by the Supreme Court. So it's then that Bishop finally realizes, oh, shit, 
I'm going to die. On February 29th, he files a motion to dismiss his lawyers, replace them with a counsel willing to abandon any further appeals. On May 2nd, 1988, the Utah Supreme Court ordered the, ordered the trial court to set an execution date. Three days later, Bishop appears before Judge Frank Noel. He's handcuffed and shackled, and, he's, and he reads a brief handwritten statement, which I am not going to read because I don't want to give his words life. But in short, he's saying he's sorry. And he wished he could have done it differently. The judge, of course, is completely unmoved and schedules the execution for June 10th, 1988. Okay, so let's talk about the needle versus the firing squad option in Utah. This exists only in Utah, Oklahoma, and Mississippi, and it's only been used three times since 1977, all of that happening in Utah. There's a reason the firing squad thing exists, especially in Utah, and that is something called blood atonement, and it's directly linked to Mormonism. So in the 1800s, there were Mormon leaders. They preached a doctrine of strict blood atonement, which basically means sinners can show repentance by spilling their own blood, and if they don't, then members of the sect were allowed to do it for you, <laughs> okay? So most people don't follow this doctrine today, except of super extremists, but it still exists as an option. So the newly devout Arthur Bishop, he actually asks the priest, hey, do I need to do this blood atonement shtick um, to be forgiven? And they're like, nah, dude, that's not a thing. Like, go for the needle. So he goes for the needle. But P.S., the firing squad is indoors like when they do it it's inside i thought it would be outside so indoors that sounds super messy like i feel bad for the person who would have to clean up that shit after an indoor firing squad like hi jenny yeah i'm sorry i'm gonna be late for the johnson's barbecue tonight oh, i know i promised but this guy chose the firing squad i know yeah it's still a thing maybe we should take up your sister's offer and just move to oregon Anyway, the bastard meets with his parents before the execution, which is weird because mostly the parents don't want to see their murdering sons before they're executed, and he spends his remaining hours fasting and praying. Bishop is executed by lethal injection on June 10th, 1988. And so ends the tale of a man who, instead of seeking help to curb his desires, acted out on them, destroying families and whole communities who would never recover from his selfish needs. It's always hard to talk about pedophilia, isn't it? I mean, murder is one thing, uh, but when you throw children or and animals, uh, I find it difficult to talk about animal abuse as well and pedophilia and hate crimes. Um, I do cover hate crimes uh, for my patrons because they're important to talk about and remember the victims of hate crimes, but those are always hard to talk about. So this was a hard one to get through, and obviously I didn't go into details about the crimes themselves, and I think that's saved all of us a lot of nightmares tonight. Um, but this was a weird one. I mean, the fact that in his childhood, usually in these childhoods, there's a lot of trauma, abuse, mental illness, and stuff like that. But in this one, there wasn't a lot of that going on, except for the fucked up Mormon church um, spewing a lot of gay hate stuff. So, which begs the question, again, is pedophilia learned behavior or is it something that you're born with? Because, I mean, first of all, he had these urges when he's 14, uh, for a seven-year-old, and then also his brother was a pedophile too. It runs in the family. Is it genetic? In which case, uh, of course, not ever letting somebody like that off the hook, but to say that, okay, it's something you're born with, is it something then that can be curbed? This is a huge discussion to have. I mean... If you are born with these leanings in that direction, is it something that you can get away from? Question mark? Well, why don't you let me know? Hey, listen, if you have an opinion on this subject, um, let me know. TrueGayCrime at gmail.com um, or better yet, go to my patron page, become a patron and join the discussion there. You know, what's the deal? There's no... Um, there's no judgments here in terms of your opinion or your suggestions or your thoughts or your questions or your, we're all in this learning and questioning and, you know, uh, growing together. So just know that. 
Also, using religion as a crush job like that, I mean, especially at the very end, like, you excommunicate yourself. I mean, let's talk about what a loser this guy is. He excommunicates himself so basically he can feel better about the shit that he's going to do. And then at the very end, when he knows he's going to die, he gets back in with religion and he gets super devout. I mean, okay. Do you think your god doesn't see through all your bullshit anyway? God. Talk about, like, just the biggest loser. Thank you for listening. And I will see you in the next episode of True Gay Crime. If you enjoyed this podcast, make sure to find the True Gay Crime Facebook page and follow us on Instagram at True Gay Crime. And we'd love to hear from you. Do you have an LGBTQ crime story from your city? You can send your story to truegaycrime at gmail.com and I'll share it on a future episode of the show. Did you know you can subscribe, rate, and review True Gay Crime on Apple Podcasts? It would mean everything to me if you did because it helps me create content you like And it lets Apple know to share it with more people. Thank you for listening. And remember, always look behind you, lock your doors, tell someone where you're going, and look out for each other. Why can't we all just get along?